This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 72, recorded on February 6th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hey, how are you doing? I'm well, and you? Very good. Is this your, is this... Happy to live in San Diego. Uh, yeah, well, when it snows and ice is here, we don't think about it too much. <laughs> yeah. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How are you? Good. It's a winter wonderland here. You didn't get the last snow ice storm, did you? Uh, we did. We got more snow this week. I yeah. probably have two feet of snow in my yard. Two feet? Oh, no. Yep. Nice. It's, I mean, it hasn't melted, so it, we just keep getting more and more and more. Cool. So, That's neat. So how many orange golf balls do you have? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah that, I have not that's golfed right. in some time. Do you know that who was it? Eisenhower used to use black golf balls. Is that right? Really? That's Why? the story I've heard. So he could do it in the snow. <laughs> golf in the snow. Be tough to putt. <laughs> It'd be tough to putt. <laughs> also joining us today from Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everybody. I should say Charleston, right? Because I say Ann Charleston. Arbor. That's where you are, right? Yes, we're we're having a beautiful winter day today. It's it's about uh, fifty five degrees. Wow, it's warm. It's winter. Warm is, is, that, is that like as cold as it gets? <laughs> no, last week we were in the ice apocalypse with the rest of the southeast. Okay, <laughs> and uh, we actually at my school for the first time we actually had two and a half snow days. Which the I university, never thought, huh? Wow. The university invoked two and a half snow days. Here at Columbia, we never close um, because it's in the city, I guess. So everyone who has to travel has to come in all the time. Oh, that's Even fine. Michigan closed one day last week for the first time in its history, I think. Wow. That's because it was so cold, I think. I don't think it was that's the snow. That's right. It was like 30 below wind chill. Cool. All right. Uh, moving on to microbiology. Uh, we have two wonderful papers today for your listening pleasure. So sit back, uh, get yourself a favorite beverage, and be prepared for the the wonderful sounds of our of our voices. <laughs> <laughs> you want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Elio, you've got the first one, uh, PLOS all paper. Right. Tell us all about that. Okay, the paper is called "The Genetic Basis of a Cerevisia Coli Patho." Adaptation to Macrophages. And it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine authors, mainly from the Gulbenkian Institute in uh, Portugal. This, now, I want to say something about that because this is a major institute, but, uh, you know, like many places in the world, it doesn't perhaps get quite the play it should. It's, it's, it was founded in 1961 by the money of Mr. Gulbenkian, and it sits about 20 kilometers outside of uh, Lisbon, and it's a very serious place. And so I'm happy to bring this to the fore and tell people that they should um, include the Gulbenkian Institute among the li in the list of important institutes in biology and in microbiology. Have you been there, Elio? No, I haven't. I wish I well, I think I'll try to go there. Actually, um, some of the authors are from the university, so it's not all um, this research institute. But, uh, you know, like many places in the world which don't have quite the visibility or the... We just don't know enough about it, and it's, we should. So, um, as I say, that's it. Anyhow, the other thing is that this paper... My first reaction to this paper was a typical reaction of an old person. <laughs> oh, I knew this all along. <laughs> I like that. I, I, it took me a while to realize that, first of all, not only did I not know it all, all along, I, in fact, um, but that in, often, even though the phenomenon under, in hand may be 
uh, you can suspect it, you can guess that this is the way the world works. Uh, knowing the details and knowing how it works is really what it's all about. So you shouldn't just poo-poo it because you, you're, you, you're a wise ass. <laughs> I sometimes have the same reaction, Elio, and I have had a long time, not just when I'm old. So I don't know what it is. Okay. Anyhow, uh, E. coli, when uh, exposed to macrophages, when interacting with macrophages, becomes more virulent. Now, the reason why I thought I knew this already is because when you put laboratory strains of bacteria, and I guess viruses, certainly of bacteria, many bacteria, into an animal, it becomes more virulent. In other words, relative to the life of the bug in the animal, life in the laboratory means that they lost the ability to become pathogenic to some extent. So, uh, and this often has to do with vir virulence factors, pathogenicity traits, which are lost in cultivation in vitro. And you may guess, if you want to, the reason they're lost because they're not needed. You don't need to have um, the, the make toxins and capsules and things when you're growing on an agar plate. But whatever it is, the fact is that you can restore this uh, ability by passage through animals. And uh, this is this is well known. I mean, you can you do this all the time. This has been known since the beginning of microbiology. So that's why I, 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 I made my comments. But it has not, best I know, not been looked at with macrophages. I don't know, Michelle, Michael, have you ever heard of an experiment like this where you take a laboratory strain, expose it to macrophages and see what happens? Yeah, actually, um, Alex Ensminger did a project like that with uh, Ralph Isberg in your old uh, house, Elio, at Tufts, huh? uh, with Legionella and macrophages. Ah, I didn't know that. Yep. You know, can you summarize the result? Is, did it come from Why don't you go through the paper first? And okay, then you'll bring it up. Great. Okay. Anyhow, uh, there's probably precedent for this. There may be other experiments that have been done like it. So here's what they did. They took an, a regular strain of E. coli, in fact, the derivative of K12 called MG1655. No, no, I'm sorry. MC4100, which is the derivative of the well-known, highly used MG1655. They're all K12 strains, which were isolated in something like 1921 or something like that. They've been around laboratories forever been mutated into the ground. These strains lo lost the prophage, they lost a bunch of things. Anyhow, regular E. coli laboratory strain couldn't be more uh, mild. You can take a bath in it. <laughs> <laughs> so they passed it through a macrophage culture. In other words, they took macrophages growing in macrophage media, and E. coli likes macrophage media. And so they exposed them, and they grew them for a whole bunch of generations. Uh, they, uh, the total number was about 450 generations, and they sampled essentially at different times. Hey, Elio, I have a question for you. Sure. I don't really address this. So what happens when you cold culture E. coli with macrophages? Are they all phagocytosed and destroyed? Are some of ah. them... So I would That's like to know so, what the pressure is here. Right. Okay. Uh, they are taken up. However, e yeah. And there is there is a point to be made right away that E. coli does not usually inhabit macrophages mm -hmm. like Salmonella. So this the choice of this uh, organism is interesting. They get phagocytized and killed usually. Okay. Uh, but some survive extracellularly. So there is a mix. It's a mixed population. Some will grow outside, just believing they're in nutrient broth of some sort, and the other ones get taken up, and uh, some get killed, and some survive. It's very mixed, okay? So it's very different than salmonella. I want to make that point. It's really important because uh, this is not a macrophage-adapted organism, okay? So they pass him around. They start out with a multiplicity of infection of one to one, one E. coli per macrophage. So the chances are they would get taken up. But at the end of this, they take, uh, they, they, they break everything up and measure the count the number of bacteria. They get up to 10 to the eighth bacteria per ml, which is quite, a, you know, after 24 hours or so, that's not surprising. It's a good medium for the bacteria. And uh, then they do this over again the next day. They transfer 10 to the 6th of these bacteria to a new macrophage 
culture, and then they do this over and over and over and over again. And they looked at six clones that they derived at the end of the experiment. I'm sorry, no, they, they, at the beginning of the experiment, they took a clone of the organism and divided it into six plates, six macrophage containing plates. So they have six clones at the end of the experiment. You with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what they find is that um, soon after this passage, the bacteria look different on, on agar plates. Many look different. They have, they're small uh, and they're called small colony variants, SCV. You never find this in vitro. Mm -hmm. this, that the, the frequency must be very, very low. So this happens, in, in fact, in macrophages at a very low frequency, but you find them. They look like E. coli, they're fine, except they're very unstable. So they revert, and they also mutate, or some of them mutate, well, actually, no, they, all, they, they, they revert at a very high frequency. However, they are good at survival intracellularly. Hmm. So this, this particular strain, is this particular variant, is capable of growing intracellularly better than the wild type. Happens that way, and then after a while, Oh, and it also seems to be more pathogenic by association with other traits. For instance, it becomes resistant to aminoglycosides. Uh, it makes uh, some some compounds that are not usually made by E. coli. It, it, it smells as if it became more pathogenic. However, it does not last long because it reverts very easily, 10 to the third generation, something like that. Now, uh, these strains are found in clinical isolates. So if you look at E. coli infections or urinary tract infections and so forth, and you play that out, you find small colony variants. However, soon you find something else arising, and this is mucoid colonies, very big translucent colonies. They're called mucoid because they are slimy. And this is what happens. Uh, the E. coli normally is not considered to be, uh, to make a capsule. This is a capsule material. E. coli is normally not contain, considered to have a big capsule. That is E. coli K12 growing on LB. However, these guys do. They make these huge colonies. They're made up of a polysaccharide called cholanic acid. And this is true not only for, uh, for E. coli, it's true for Pseudomonas, and through for a number of other bugs. In fact, the uh, the the theme, as as our listeners probably know, uh, the theme of having a capsule is very common in the world of pathogenic microbes. Many many bacteria, meningococcus, pneumococcus, and uh, Klebsiella, an awful lot of pathogens have a capsule, and the reason is in general because it helps them resist phagocytosis. And sure enough, this mucus. Uh, colonies resist phagocytosis. Uh, colonic acid, by the way, is made under some forms of stress, and being exposed to macrophages is certainly stressful. So these guys escape phagocytosis, uh, whereas the small colony variants resist phagocytosis. So um, this escape is uh, probably because they are so slimy that this, the macrophages can't, can grab hold of them. So these guys, the result is these guys grow extracellularly well. So the small colony variants are adapted to intracellular life. The mucus uh, slimy ones are adapted to, macro, to extracellular life. Now, if you take the, the mucoid ones and you put them in mice, you find that the LD50, that is the lethal dose that kills 50% of the mice, is five to 10 times lower. In other words, they're five to 10 times more virulent uh, than the uh, original strain. So um, there's a question, a residual question. Is this something that happens because they affect the macrophages directly or simply because they avoid being taken up by the macrophages. And it looks like the macrophages are really not affected directly. They don't, they don't know that the bacteria are there. They make uh, tumor necrosis factor, one of the principal cytokines made by macrophages at the same rate as if the bacteria weren't there. So this is the basic result. You grow bacteria in the presence of macrophages, you go through a transition of finding certain strange mutants, if you want to call them that, at this point, you don't know that that's what they are. And then eventually you end up with very slimy bacteria, which uh, are more pathogenic. Alio, okay so in the mice, 
do do they know if these selected strains can replicate inside of the mouse macrophages? Uh, no, I know. Well, they, they they didn't do that. I know because that would. I mean, you would like to know why they are. No, no, they 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 just avoid being taken up by macrophages because they're slimy. I see. That's I think that's the idea. But in uh, in the selection. So one of the phenotypes from the selected is that they can grow intracellularly, right? They can resist. That's a small cow. That's well, a small they can grow that. in co co culture. I think is a better way to describe it. So That's not right. necessarily intracellularly. That's right. No. So right. the basis for the increased virulence in mice, we don't know, right? No, right. but it's likely that they resist phagocytosis. This is a common theme. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it is so. Let me let me tell you how powerful this is. If you take a encapsulated pneumococcus and you inject it in the peritoneal cavity of a mouse, one pneumococcus will kill that mouse in 18 hours. So that's mm -hmm. how powerful, if, to encapsulate bacteria, parts of the body, like the peritoneal cavity, are plain nutrient broth. There's nothing there to keep them from growing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Michelle, am I right about this? Um, you're right. I don't know that they did that exact experiment in this study. Certainly that's the strong prediction of the mucoid no, they, mutants. They, they simply say that the, the LD50 goes down by a factor of 5 right. to 10. Right, but they didn't, so, I mean, to their, they were really doing a, a population genetic study here and didn't right. invest that much effort in the what we would call cellular microbiology. So the mechanism isn't quite clear just yet. Uh, could, I, but notice that the LD50 of E. coli is not one like it is for the pneumococcus and Klebsiella and a number of other bugs. It's, it's really quite high. It takes quite a few E. coli to kill a mouse. Okay, that's, Especially MC4100. MC4100 right. is, is really a, a very lab-tame strain. But, exactly. But like that other twin paper that we did previously – showing that even K-12 strains can become virulent. Yeah, um, yeah. I remember this, that. I think this story here, taken with some of the genetics that's going on in that former paper, and I don't remember which twim it is, so I'll have to look that one up. But that's what I was thinking about as I was reading this. But this was just absolutely fascinating how there's evolution, if you will, in an infection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the infection being an in vitro infection with macrophages. Yeah. So anyhow, they have this basic result, which is, I think, quite solid, that uh, cell, the, the bacteria change a lot when they're co-cultured with macrophages. So they look at the genetics, and the genetics are really quite interesting, and I think they were sort of lucky that they found interesting things. So in, uh, I think, five of the six clones, they saw that there are two insertion mutations, and one is in, the, in a gene I didn't know anything about. It has a funny name, YRF, capital F. This is... Obviously, E. coli talk, it's a gene that has an unknown function. However, it's 80% homologous to a salmonella gene called IgAA. By the way, as an aside, I wish they wouldn't call it IgA because that to an immunologist mm -hmm. would mean something completely different. Don't confuse it with, <laughs> with immunoglobulin A. It's simply the name of a gene, IgA. And IgA regulates the... Um, uh, synthesis of cholinic acid, the com principal component of the capsule of this E. coli. It does this by a regulatory system called RCS. So there's a mutation which leads to the increased production of cholinic acid. That's fine. The other one, which is very interesting, is that there is a mutation in a gene called, in the promoter of a gene called LON. LON, which is an old friend of bacterial physiologists, it's been around mm. since the beginning of E. coli genetics. Uh, and LON also regulates, it does a large number of things. It's about as pleiotropic as can be. It's involved in cell division, it's involved in um, the SOS response and so forth. But mutants in lawn make more cholinic acid again. So this is interesting. It's also a mutator, which is why, um, uh, because the stability of, the, of transposases, remember transposes, the enzymes involved in the insertion of transposers depend on lawn protease. 
And one and thing so, you may want to point out to the listener, not being the E. coli geneticist that you are, Elio, is that not, L- the, LON <laughs> stands for long form filament. Right. So these these E. coli will actually, if you will, turn into snakes. That's and, right. They, and that's how they it, were originally isolated. And it really begins to show you how different the microbe is becoming interacting with lawn and, and the profound changes that lawn can have on the global physiology of the individual cell. That's so true. Uh, and it's not clear what all it mat- why all this matters. I mean, certainly filamentation is kind of something associated with virulence in some cases, for instance. But here it's probably more related to the uh, formation of colonic acid. So the idea, uh, there's other, other genes are involved too. They find genes in spermidine uptake. I found it quite interesting in an elongation factor in protein synthesis and so forth. So there are other mutations involved. There are probably quite a few that they haven't looked, haven't studied in detail. But these appear in, I think, five of the six clones that they studied. So the, to summarize what they, what they found, co-culturing a tame, mild uh, weakling like E. coli, uh, the, the, the e. coli we, we we're talking about here, MC4100, makes it into not exactly a tiger, but at least it makes it more virulent. And this is it can be understood on the level of what going, what's going on by the formation of first um, mutants which are more able to withstand the phagocytosis step, and secondly, mutants which avoid phagocytosis altogether, namely the mucoid ones. So this is evolution in sight, and the contribution here, which is, I think, very important, is that it brings up what genes are involved. And it's sort of a phenotypic study of an evolutionary phenomenon. I think this whole idea of evolving towards virulence is really interesting. I always think about this in, in virology because it's not clear why a virus would evolve naturally to be more virulent unless it helps some fundamental property. In this case, Im- immune evasion would be a good explanation, but there are no examples of that in virology where it's really hard to... You can't do this kind of experiment in virology very effectively. You don't evolution to virulence, increased virulence is very hard. So, if anything, it's the opposite. I mean, yeah. one of the early things in microbiology was Pasteur passing rabies virus and finding that if yeah. you passed it to rabbits, it became less virulent. That's right. So I think if we had a system like this where you could do that, you may get... I, I would suspect that for a virus, acquisition of enhanced immune evasion would make it more virulent. So in, mm-hmm. my view is... In order to evade the macrophage, it has to make this capsule or uh, secrete colon, and the, the the increased virulence is a consequence of that. But I don't think that's the primary selective factor for the bacterium virulence per se. It just happens to accompany when you make yourself resistant to macrophages. And if we could do that for a virus, it would be very informative. But there simply isn't a parallel experiment. Well, let me ask you a question, Vincent. Uh, with all the discussion about influenza. Uh, doesn't influenza effectively do this with the antigenic drift and the antigenic shift that is common to to that virus, especially if you mix two different strains of influenza in the same, uh, if you will, lung cell? Well, if you, what happens with influenza is that it evolves to evade immune responses, antibody responses, for example. Right. right? But it doesn't acquire additional virulence in doing that. It simply is able to infect uh, someone who's immune to to the previous strain. So there's no good, in my view, there's no good evidence for acquisition of virulence by influenza. Naturally, we haven't seen it occur. In bacteria, this may be a common theme. Yes. Uh, Michelle, you refer to Legionella work. You know, when I talk about right, and that, that actually raises a slightly expanded point, which is it's true that these strains are more virulent in their mouse model, but what they haven't tested is whether they're more fit for infection in a population. So Mm. to be successful, a pathogen has to replicate within a host, but also be transmitted efficiently. And the common cold virus is a great example of that. It's quite successful because it can be transmitted so easily. And 
this other paper um, that Alex Ensminger um, published when he was a postdoc with uh, Ralph Isberg at Tufts, and Alex is now uh, faculty at University of Toronto. He, using Legionella, was able to ask another level of question, which is he did a similar experiment, passage Legionella multiple times through macrophages, and then asked whether they were more or less fit when placed in a different phagocyte, amoeba, which is their oh. natural host in the environment. And interestingly, they found he found some mutations that made Legionella more fit in macrophages, but then less fit in their natural host. Mm -hmm. So he made the argument that um, Legionella, which grows in the pond, lives in fresh water, and is probably um, fed on by lots of different amoeba. All those different hosts basically keep certain pathways intact. So even if a pathway makes you more fit in one host, it might make you less fit in another host or another... Mm -hmm environmental situation and then those variants would be lost from the population it's interesting so by the way they did uh, i just didn't mention it but in the e coli experiment they did look at fitness by comparing the growth of the original strain and the mutated strain oh and by the way i, I should media. mention this in, in in the macrophage in culture. the macrophage mm -hmm. yeah and they found that the mutants are in fact more fit and by the way they, 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 it's kind of cute how they did it normally you would mark uh, one of the strains with uh, antibiotic resistance and the other one sensitive and you played out the gamish on antibiotic medium and non-antibiotic medium and count colonies they did it in a more clever way they labeled the cells with uh, different colors fluorescent proteins and did uh, they put them through a cell sorter they simply counted the cells uh, by the color they had and this is a faster way of measuring the ratio between two different kinds of bacteria we'll probably see a lot more of this and plus you don't have to place the population under the selective stress of being able to grow on the antibiotics so it's probably a better That's reflection right. it's probably of better yeah what's going on right so let me let me just end with another viral story to address this evolution to, to pathogenicity. And this is because today I just lectured to medical students about enteric virus infections, and I talk about polio on the one hand and norovirus on the other hand. So in the gut, polio does not produce any gastroenteritis, no diarrhea, no vomiting. Yet it's a very effective pathogen at spreading from one person to another. Now, its incursion into the CNS, which is quite rare, is to me an accident and has nothing to do with transmission because once the virus gets in the CNS, it can't trans cannot transmit. Norovirus, on the other hand, also replicates in the gut. It causes, you know, two days of diarrhea and vomiting. Why does it have to be virulent in the gut? Because clearly polio shows that you don't need to be uh, hmm. virulent in order to be transmitted. So I don't understand why noroviruses do that. And this is the problem I have with a lot of virology. I don't understand why the virulence is there unless it clearly helps transmission. So you could argue that making you cough or sneeze more helps transmission, and that's fine. But in this case, it's, it's not clear. Well, Vincent, norovirus is infectious for up to three weeks after the initial bout of diarrhea without any symptoms in the... Right. In the affected patient. And so does that get around your conundrum? Well, then you c it could be successful without causing the diarrhea and vomiting, right? Because you're right. It actually, it's the asymptomatic shedding after you've recovered that spreads the virus. Yeah. So is there a difference in how long the vi two viruses have co-evolved with the human host? Is, uh, has yeah. polio come into balance because it's... It could be part of that. I, for so long. I mean, yeah, I bet that I, I suspect we've had polio with us for a lot longer than like TB. Yeah. So neuro probably has come recently from right. some marine reservoir. So that could but, be it. Sure. But neuro is is so infectious at such a I mean, it, it only takes on average 18 variants That's to right. cause disease. <laughs> How many polio does it take to cause disease? I don't think anyone has ever done that experiment. It's, it's, I've seen the number 18 recently also, yeah. So that could be also part of the transmission. But then, you, you, again, you don't, need to be, you don't need to have this virulence in the GI tract. So, Vincent, how do you relate this to the E. coli story? So, in, e in this E. coli story, there's a clear 
uh, acquisition of virulence by evading macrophages. So you select for evasion of macrophages, uh, and that makes you virulent. It makes sense because you're uh, evading the immune response, so you, you replicate and you cause disease. In the virus, there I see very few examples of how uh, increased virulence uh, aids in any aspect of, of pathogenesis. So there's not that nice connection between an ev immune evasion and pathogenesis. Uh -huh. All right. So, I, I mean, I have always tried to figure out this ev evolution to virulence in virology is, is a hotly discussed topic. You know, there are people who think that it's natural. And if you read the press, people, the science writers are always talking about, oh, in this influenza virus is going to evolve to greater virulence. Yet, I, I have never seen any example of when this happens. Right. So it's an interesting issue. All right. Anyway. Okay. Thank you, Elio. Sure. Interesting story. I think this is very, for me, this is uh, very enlightening because it puts into perspective why a pathogen would become virulent. And maybe there's a, a parallel in virology like this that we haven't found yet. All right. Our second paper, Michael Schmidt. It's an interesting story. It's, it's about microbial warfare. And it's likely been going on as long as the two major different classes of bacteria have existed, the gram positives and the gram negatives. And it, it really is a story of how these two are trying to compete in, in the same niche. And they're, they're using a tremendous weapon of mass destruction that is literally taking advantage of the way the enemy – or the other microbe lives. And we, the humans, are effectively the battlefield. And so we're suffering <laughs> the collateral damage. It, I, I heard the, the senior author, Marvin Whitley, uh, tell this story and at a seminar recently here at MUSC. And he only you know glanced over this particular paper because it, it hadn't come out yet. But I was intrigued enough to go and and look up some of his work. And I, uh, by that point in time, uh, PNAS had released the paper. So I, I thought this one was, was twimmable. And the reason <laughs> for it is the first reference in the paper is from none other than the, the father of microbiology, Louis Pasteur. And Louis Pasteur did this experiment back in 1877 where he used one microbe to cure a patient of anthrax. And the microbe that he used to cure the patient of anthrax was Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, you kidding? No. Wow. <laughs> now, to and, – and so what I'm assuming, because I can't read the original paper in French, so I, I went out searching for the original paper in French and – we don't have any more books in our library, so everything is interlibrary loan. So it's it's a it's a hazard for me to go back to look for a paper from 1877. Um, but anyway, what I think went on with Pasteur's experiment that's described in the first reference is that it was probably wool sorters disease or cutaneous anthrax, and he treated them with a. a a preparation of, of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which produces pyocyanin. And as Vincent's teaching medical students this semester, they probably are trying to memorize what pyocyanin does. So I commend them to looking up this particular paper because it really shows how this remarkable molecule that actually brings color to Pseudomonas on a Petri plate because everybody knows – or every medical student knows that uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa produces pyocyanin. And every medical student will probably tell you it's a strict aerobe, but it's not. Pseudomonas is not a strict aerobe. It can be a facultative anaerobe. And uh, that gets to some of the clinical significance of this particular paper. But this is a really simple story between uh, – let me, let me break in. Sure. Um, I'm really tempted to go find this paper because the Pasteur <laughs> paper, because why on earth did he do this? What, what got him to think of it? You know, he didn't have the FP, FDA on his neck, but still. It's the first reference in uh, the PNAS reference yeah. list. Yeah, I see and, it. And it's, uh, it's called coal and septicemia. That's what Charbonne 
effectively transliterates into English, according to Google. So coal and septicemia. And uh, so no, it's anthrax. Charbonne is a name for anthrax. Well, that's what it was. Yeah, and uh, the same as the title, but where on earth? How? What? Why pseudomonas? I don't they must know. Have something. There must have been a reason for doing this. Yeah, hey, Leo, it's a good reason to go to Paris. Okay, <laughs> that's right. So, yeah, you're sending me there. Yeah, tell ASM I'm to pay for it. My bags. <laughs> I, I think we should go to the Pasteur Institute and have a twim there to discover. The roots of this be fun. And, Count me and, in. <laughs> and and Whiteley uh, told the story about Pasteur, and he cites this particular reference in in a number of his his manuscripts. But this this story takes advantage of the way the gram positives live, and this was a fun fact that I hadn't known before. I heard Marvin tell the story. I didn't know that gram positives turn over. 25% of their peptidoglycan upon each cell division, and Staph aureus actually turns over 40% of its peptidoglycan where it's actually dumped into the medium. Hmm. Did you guys know that? Taken back up. Yeah, then t they take it back up, the fragments, and recycle yeah. them. Yeah, they, they're the ultimate sustainable bacterium. It, they recycle them. But I had never known that, and it and it really makes a lot of sense because in the CAN lectures we give to the med students, we tell them peptidoglycan is inflammatory, and you you wonder where the peptidoglycan is coming from. But there's a lot of gram positive, so you you understand that when you do get uh, septicemia, you're dumping all this peptidoglycan into the system, so you can appreciate how it's uh, inflammatory. And the title of this particular paper is specifically about community surveillance enhances Pseudomonas aeruginosa virulence during a polymicrobial infection. So the simple metaphor of, of this is the bacteria or the microbes, specifically Pseudomonas, in, invented uh, the first tweet or Twitter <laughs> because the signal, the signal, and then we'll get into the meat of the paper, is – the N-acetylglucosamine, which they abbreviate uh, GLCNAC, G-L-C-N-A-C, which is N-acetyl glucosamine. Yeah, glucosamine. Yeah, I'm I'm blanking. Uh, and so, what um, this molecule does is it actually turns on a suite of genes in Pseudomonas, and the product that comes out of this is pyocyanin. That's that's effectively how they tumbled into it. And we know that pyocyanin is antimicrobial to gram positives. And so this is effectively the weapons of mass destruction that Pseudomonas is taking advantage of the its enemy providing the signal. And it, it's really, I guess, if you will, primitive quorum sensing. And in fact, it is indeed quorum sensing because the genes that the peptidoglycan are signaling are actually turning on a suite of quorum regulated genes in Pseudomonas. And so I'll, I'll take you through the story here. They they first did and and their first figure they they so, are wait, hold on a second for the, for the to to clarify it further. The difference between this and what one normally thinks of quorum sensing is that normal quorum sensing, certainly what was originally discovered, was all communication between bacteria of one species. Correct. And this is communication between bacteria of different species. And there are other examples of interspecies quorum sensing. And that's what this, this one is, right? Yes. And except this is... Um much bigger. It's it's like I guess, if you will, a a tweet by a famous person where it goes out to the <laughs> masses. You know, because the the peptidoglycan is not specifically turning on one set of genes. It it can turn on quite a number, I I would assume. So the first experiment they did is they wanted to know if it was indeed this glicnac that was actually responsible and whether or not it was peptidoglycan. So the first thing they did is they went on a hunt for glicnac unresponsive mutants. And so any 
first year graduate student is probably faced with this question in their first microbial genetics class is how do you hunt for something that can't do something? And the way they did this is they took advantage of the fact that pyocyanin is colored. And you can, of course, measure this spectrophotometrically. So they got their garden variety transposon and they planted it on the parental strain of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then they screened in 96 well plates, plus and minus glicnac or plus and minus peptidoglycan, and they looked for absence of color that was above background because Pseudomonas aeruginosa will make a background level of pyocyanin. And, and so they were looking at mutants that didn't do something in the presence of the stimulus. And their hypothesis is the stimulus was um, this glicnac or peptidoglycan. And, and this take I think we should we should give a shout out. They actually screened five thousand seven hundred and sixty mutants. <laughs> you stole so, my you This stole is very my... elegant, but it but it took some some patience on oh, the no, part of that. This is this is in the olden times, this would kill many boxes of toothpicks. Uh, but <laughs> but but here, no toothpicks were harmed, Michael. No no toothpicks were harmed. Uh, and again, this really drives home the cleverness of this group of taking advantage of this colored end product, pyocyanin. And well, they still had to they still had to pick the mutants into the ninety six oh no. well plates. No, no, they they did indeed have to do that. So from the from from the fifty seven hundred sixty. They from their non-redundant transposon mutant library uh, that they screened, they got 59 potential glicnac sensing mutants that were identified in their first screen, and then they again did what every first-year graduate student writes in the second sentence of their answer: is they rescreened the isolates again, measuring quantitatively, again using the spectrophotometric assay, again driving home the importance of of quantitation in in the analysis because it's all about gene doses and gene expression oftentimes in in virulence and so then they got finally at the end of this they got 14 bona fide pseudomonas aeruginosa mutants that did not enhance the production of pyocyanin in, in the presence of this glicnac molecule and so that's the figure they show you uh, the first figure is uh, they they have their mutants, and so let's just screen a a mutant. And the one they had was Pseudomonas aeruginosa. They named it uh, 601, and so it didn't respond to the signal. Their control uh, sugar, if you will, that they're adding to the medium to give them baseline is the molecule uh, succinate, which uh, is a four carbon. Uh, dicarboxylic acid that we all remember from from the Krebs cycle. And so what they show you is that um, the wild type strain, Pseudomonas aeruginosa PA14, uh, in the presence of glicnac, produces significantly greater concentrations of pyocyanin. And then they show the mutant that doesn't. It, it's effectively producing the same concentration that uh, succinate produced. And then they take the same mutant, uh, the PA601, and they put the gene that they isolated for this particular regulatory element and they put it on a plasmid. And then they put that into the mutant and they ask the question, does it complement? And sure enough, when you put the plasmid into the mutant that doesn't respond to the glicnac, voila, you make the same concentration or near the same concentration of pyocyanin as you did in the control situation. So then they uh, conclude that um, this particular molecule is um, responsive and then they began to tease apart the genetics of this uh, system. And then they bring into the story about um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and how – uh, pyocyanin is regulated off of this quorum sensing uh, operon, and the signal for this quorum sensing operon is 2 heptyl 3 hydroxy 4 quinolone. 
and this is referred to in the people who do quorum sensing as the pseudomonas quinolone signal or PQS. And it this particular signaling molecule controls the expression of both elastase, which is another virulence factor associated with pseudomonas, as well as, as the pyocyanin. And their hypothesis at this point in time is that Pseudomonas aeruginosa enhances the production of PQS in the presence of glycnac. So you're actually enhancing the virulence operon that is normally corn related. So if you will, the peptidoglycan is acting as an amplifier in the absence of the quorum of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So you can be a lone Pseudomonas aeruginosa sitting there, and if you're not getting the full quorum sense, the glycnac from the dead or dying Staph aureus or Gram Pavses that are out in the vicinity will actually signal the upregulation of this. And the consequence, of course, is you're going to the pyocyanin will kill the gram positives and you'll have more food so you'll be able to grow up your population and and do all sorts of wonderful things as a community of, of pseudomonas. And so in support of their hypothesis, this takes us to the other two panels uh, in their figure where they look at the levels of elastase and P PQS produce plus and minus of, of the succinate and the glycnac in the concert of uh, the mutant and the complemented mutant. And what they learned is that the glycnac or this debris from peptidoglycan actually resulted in approximately threefold higher levels of PQS during the growth in the presence of this uh, glycnac and also peptidoglycan. And this was not uh, observed in, in the mutant strain. So now, now they have teased this apart and they understand what the peptidoglycan is doing. And so now this is where it gets really cool because they now use a very different form of an animal model that we were talking about in the last paper. They're actually going to use fruit flies as their animal model. And so they're going to ask the question in this Drosophila infection model, uh, whether or not the peptidoglycan sensing would enhance Pseudomonas aeruginosa pathogenesis in the co-infection with um, gram-positive uh, bacteria. And so the way this fruit fly model works is really pretty clever and it takes advantage of the gastrointestinal tract uh, of fruit flies and the fact what you feed fruit flies is basically a sucrose solution. And so the way this fruit fly model works is um, you put your microbe in the sucrose, the fruit flies drink the microbe, the microbe becomes engrafted in specifically the crop which I guess in poultry is the equivalent of the gizzard and uh, it's a reservoir of bacteria and most of the microbes in this crop happen to be gram positive. And remember that the gram positive bacteria they have previously established, it was gram positive peptidoglycan that was uh, the signal that was res responsible. Uh, for that. And so the next suite of experiments that they did was simply asking uh, the question whether or not peptidoglycan could enhance Pseudomonas virulence during the co-culture with these uh, gram-positive uh, bacteria. So what they did is uh, the flies that were used in the experiments were colonized with approximately 60,000 gram-positive bacteria in their crops. And they figured this out by just, you know, isolating the crop and then planting them on a petri plate, counting them. So they're, they're effectively, you know, a, a viable cell assay. And uh, the gram-positive bacteria actually are responsible for 60 percent 
of the total bacteria that are recovered from the crop. So it's 60% gram positive, 40% uh, gram negative. And because they were not co-colonizing the flies with bacteria during the infection uh, with the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, they hypothesized that the source of glicnac in these infections was the peptidoglycan that was shed by the gram positive bacteria that were in the crop already of the fruit flies because these are not notobiotic fruit flies. Hmm. I don't even think you, you can get notobiotic <laughs> fruit flies because I don't know how much you would feed them and you know fruit fly digestion is is complicated. So as you can almost guess the way they did the fruit fly experiment is they fed the flies a mixture of antibiotics designed to selectively kill off the native gram positives, but not the gram negative flora associated with the crop. So it's it's really a an exercise in antibiotic stewardship. You you kill off the right microbes that you that you want for the particular experiment. And so they the first control they did is after the antibiotic treatment, they asked, were there any gram positives in the Drosophila crop? And the answer was no. So now they have a clean experiment. So now they feed these fruit flies the Pseudomonas. So you have Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that's wild type. So that's your one variable. And then the second one is Pseudomonas aeruginosa that has the mutant that doesn't respond to glicnac. And then the third one is, of course, the Pseudomonas aeruginosa that has the plasmid that's complementing the genetic lesion on the chromosome. And so what they then learned is, is exactly what you would anticipate based on the, ex the first experiment where the glicnac that is being added is going to stimulate virulence. And when they did the experiment, they found that the antibiotic-treated flies showed a significant delay in killing – when colonized well, with, <laughs> I mean, well, with wild type. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but significant, kind of a two days delay. I'm, I'm not, I can't say that I'm overwhelmed. I mean, the data look convincing, but it's not a huge effect. Well, I think it goes to the model. And mm -hmm. I don't sure. have that much of an intuition for what significance means in the model. And Alio brings up a good point. So I haven't had enough time to go off and, and read the models. And um, I put up in the show notes uh, a particular paper from Disease Models and Mechanisms called Drosophila melanogaster as a model for human intestinal infection and pathology. And I have to read that more carefully to specifically address Alios criticism is a, a two day greater period uh, significant. And the next experiment they did in order to reverse it is they add the glicnac back to the wild type and what they see is the restoration of the virulent phenotype. That is to say, if gram positives were in the crop, they would only take two days for pseudomonas to wipe out the flies. And the way they do these experiments is with the classic Kaplan-Meier curve, which is effectively measuring live individuals. But here, the, the clever thing is instead of using mice, they have 100 fruit flies. And what they do is at the end of the day, they count how many flies they have alive on each day, and then they grind them up and they can literally count the bacteria out of the crop to effectively who's there and how many are there. And so they actually get a whole bunch of, of powerful uh, information out of, out of the system. And considerably cheaper and faster than a mouse model. Oh, yes. The Animal Use Committee, uh, I don't even know if you have to take fruit no, flies to the no. Animal Use Committee. You don't have to. I mean, the key here also is that the mutant doesn't respond to the addition of peptidoglycan, right? Correct. That. That's what I was just coming to. Sorry. But you guys are you guys are anticipating because the experiments are so straightforward in in doing this. And uh, then they looked at PQS and um, and, and they they do point out they they're good stewards of their of presenting their data. 
They do point out a caveat. It should be noted that although the results strongly implicate the PQS induction as a mechanism of enhanced fly killing, they do not rule out a more general role of glicnac in stimulating um, Pseudomonas originosa virulence. And I guess they're going to have to uncouple what they per- think is going on with the mutant Pseudomonas is they have a two-component signaling system going on, but they haven't isolated all the circuits associated with the two-component signaling system in order to figure out what's going on. Michael, could we do this in a mammalian model? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they take it to the mouse next. Oh, okay, good. They take it to the mouse next. And uh, there, so, you, there you need your institutional animal committee approval. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And in fact, um, you, you can tell they're very respectful of the use of animals because they're using a non-lethal model. And as Alio pointed out in the last paper, you know, the peritoneum of mice is, is uh, uh, you know, it only takes one organism to, to take it out. But um, in this particular model, what they did is they used the, the back of the mouse and they opened a window and they um, had a murine chronic wound model. And so the, this particular model involves creating a, a one and a half by one and a half centimeter uh, surgical wound on the back of a mouse that is then subsequently colonized with bacteria covered with a semi-permeable uh, dressing to protect the wound from contaminating bacteria from the bedding. And after four days, the wound tissue is harvested and the bacterial numbers are assessed by conventional culture techniques. And again, what they did is they used their wild type uh, construct and their mutants and their mutant uh, complemented in trans. And what they did indeed again find is that the Pseudomonas originosa mutant, uh, the PA0601 with Staph aureus were enriched for Staph aureus. Uh, because, again, they didn't have any – it wasn't able to respond to the glicnac while in the wild-type situation, the pseudomonas outnumbered the staphylococci by 110 to 1, effectively showing you how Louis Pasteur cured anthrax in a wound model because I was assu- – I'm assuming it's – wool sorters disease and they have cutaneous anthrax and so they cure the anthrax by putting the pseudomonas on it the anthrax is bacillus it turns over its peptidoglycan and voila the wool sorters disease is cured which today if you ask that question people would never put pseudomonas originos onto a wound mm, sure <laughs> so it it's it's really a fascinating story of of how you take things apart, you know, you do basic genetics, and uh, you can tell a really fascinating story. I was especially intrigued by the Drosophila animal model because if, if we're able to understand signaling, it, the Drosophila may give us a way of doing a lot of these interesting microbiome type stories where we could see, you know, how to establish communities because flies are much easier than mice and uh, you can grind up the fly to figure out what's going on. They're easier to isolate the RNA out of because they're not as big. And um, so it's a really neat and clean story. But like everything, it's you have to begin to figure out what the glicnac is actually signaling in that one particular mutation that they recovered out of that pseudomonas. What I think is cool here is that it's the same issue that I brought up in the previous paper. So here, the pseudomonas is producing chemicals in response to peptidoglycan that are meant to kill its competitors. Correct. But the side effect is that it also kills the host, you know, yes. the fly what? and presumably a mouse. This is a non-lethal model. So it's a, it's a collateral damage, right? The- this is why right. I used the metaphor at the beginning that this is the war between two warring factions, if you will, the Hatfields and the McCoys. And we're effectively Tennessee or Kentucky, wherever the Hatfields and McCoys feud was. And the, you know, the, we're the ground that's taking the worst of the beating. 
so it's so it's becoming more virulent, but not because that in itself is beneficial, but it's a collateral of killing your competitors. I think this is very cool, and and and, and it probably evolved in in the environment, right, in the soil, yeah, as oh, a absolutely. way for pseudomonas to fight and and maybe liberate nutrients from other microbes in yeah. the in the environment. And well, then, that's what pyocyanin does. It's is it accelerates lysis. And, and then, and then, Michelle, once they get into a mammalian host, they don't care if they kill it, right? Right. It's right. they're not going to evolve to be uh, to kill their competitors, but not the the mammalian host. That would be crazy. No, they just want it. Their goal is to make two. Yeah. And for the two <laughs> to make four. So this is so you you guys in the microbial the bacterial world have a very clear explanation for the acquisition of virulence, and this is what I would like to have in the viral world. That's my main point. Could I, I'm puzzled um, by the specificity. Glicknack is a you know a, a sugar, and but yet they refer to this as a as a target of, of gram positives. Gram negatives would also make peptidoglycan that would have glicknack. Hmm. So I'm wondering if the sensitivity of the gram positives just reflects that gram positives make so much more gl peptidoglycan. I think it's a I would I would hypothesize it's concentration, Michelle. Yeah. I'd also like to add, I was able to uh, communicate with the first author, Ashwarya. She got her master's degree first in Mumbai, India, and then joined Whiteley's group for her PhD at UT Austin and worked on this project. And she said it was her thinking about the sputum of cystic fibrosis patients that's really high in glicknack that got her thinking about that as a signaling uh, molecule uh, for um, for oh, pseudomonas. Wow. But she um, gave story. a lot of credit to Martin uh, Marvin as a great um, thesis advisor, and she also was fortunate to do um, a lot of teaching as a PhD student. Realized that she just loves um, teaching, working with undergraduates, and so she has moved on now to a senior lecturer position at Texas State University, which is in San Marcos, Texas, not far from San Ant or not far from Austin, and she's teaching microbiology to undergraduates there, and and hopes to ins inspire them to uh, a career in microbiology. Cool. Well, she inspired me with this paper. It's nice. Ah, that's great. It's very nice. All right, thank you, Michael. I didn't know you could use flies as a model for. For this. This is really neat. All right, let's do a couple of email. They have been accumulating. Here's one from Jim. Hello, my name is Jim from Vancouver. I have no formal education in phraseology, but am an enthusiastic follower of TWIP, TWIM, and TWIV. I don't know. I don't understand phraseology. Why he brings that up. Anyway, recently I found I followed a program about yeast infections and the threat to public health they can pose. My question is, would it be possible to isolate the infectious yeast agents and brew a beer that would act as a vaccine against these infections? I understand that the brewing process kills the yeast, so there would be no chance of contamination by the dead yeast, which would be filtered out in any case. There were plans at one point to add vitamins to beer to improve public health, so the idea is not that unusual. <laughs> The question is, would this brew provide a heads up to the immune system that would prevent yeast infections from taking hold? What do you think? I don't know if you can brew beer with the same yeast that you want to protect against, right? Besides, yeast is usually pasteur uh, beer is usually pasteurized. But uh, let me ask you, is there a single yeast uh, fungus-based vaccine in the world? I can think of no, one. No, I don't, I don't know of any. I don't know of any. But the principle oh. is an interesting one, but I, I think... Oh, I do know that people are working on coccidio, coccidioidesimitis, valley fever, and they're having a very hard time. But that's a very, would be a very important vaccine to, to have because so many people are affected by this by deceased in the desert. But I don't, I don't know of anything else. I don't know of but any you have to vaccine. leave the yeast in the beer because if you filtered out the yeast before people drank it, then the antigen would not yeah, reach the right. person right. high enough. Uh, there have been other uh, attempts to put antigens in food. Um, oh, sure. So Hillary Koprowski for many years was trying to make bananas that would give you viral vaccines by putting proteins in the banana. You can do it with tomatoes and other plants. I think it's hard because it's hard to control dose. If, yeah. you, if you eat too many bananas, you're going to get too much antigen and so forth. So, The motivation is that it, it eliminates the need for a cold chain. So you don't need yeah. to keep the vaccine refrigerated while delivering yeah. it to villages in Africa. Although, uh, Michelle, if you like your beer warm, 
uh, like <laughs> like some people do in this world, that wouldn't be so good, right? <laughs> we should ask Arturo Casa de Valle, Einstein, about the, this question. That's he a good would point. know. He would know the answer right away. I will ask Arturo. And then Jim says, would it be possible to have a TWIF this week in fungus as part of your audio library? There are so many other valid topics that fungus tends to be neglected. Yeah. That's true. It's true. Ask that of Arturo. If someone wants to do a TWIF with me, I'd be happy to, to take care of it. I need a fungal expert. So anyone out there interested, let me know. Uh, the next one is from Dallas, who writes, Dear Twimmers. I was catching up on the podcast, and in TWIM64, you discussed antibiotic resistance and connections between animal husbandry and human disease issues. A recent article in Science, Distinguishable Epidemics of Multidrug-Resistant Salmonella in Different Hosts, seems to indicate a lack of transmission from animal to human populations. The comment was then made that the same potential transmission problems would be true for aquaculture animals, where antibiotic resistance is also an issue. However, we need to keep in mind that there are very few pathogens for fish that are zoonotic, excluding helminths that go between bears and wild salmon and seals and some fish. And most aquatic pathogens don't grow at human body temperatures. Even more important, antibiotics almost triple the cost of fish feed, and very few antibiotics are allowed, and those are only for a few species. Unlike pigs and chickens, where adding antibiotics to the feed improves the growth rate and decreases feed consumption, Adding antibiotic to fish feeds provides no growth effect and actually decreases the animal's immune system. It's not good for husbandry. I had previously sent the TWIV a graph showing that in decrease in antibiotic use in a Norway salmon production as vaccinations solve the problems. Notes, uh, so he sent a graph uh, showing a correlation between um, the use of antibiotics and the amount of fish produced, which is quite interesting. Activist organizations, including Pew, have a, had a multi-million dollar demarketing campaign against aquaculture in the U.S. and have succeeded in framing the images in the society. Other aquaculture myths that are sold to the public by environmental activists are caused by the mandated color-added label on farmed salmon when you include astaxanthin in the diet, despite the fact that the chemical is identical to the astaxanthin that makes wild salmon pink. In addition, most people in the U.S. believe that salmon and other carnivorous fish require fish meal in their diets and are thus depleting the ocean resources. We know enough about fish nutrition to create totally vegan diets for carnivorous marine fish, which outperform fish meal-based control diets. However, the ingredients used in these vegan diets are also useful in chicken and pig diets, and fish meal is less desirable in these species. It makes chicken taste like fish and egg yolks gray. <laughs> Economics pushes fish meal into fish diets, not biology, and this whole fish meal issue is manufactured by activists for emotional appeal. If all agriculture went away, the fish meal market would shift back to pigs, cows, chickens, dogs, and cat feeds, just as it was before agriculture was a significant business. The international harvesting of fish meal has been constant for about four decades, while aquaculture has grown by a factor of 100. One of my interests in listening to TWIV, TWIM, etc. is related to the observation that aquaculture systems are really controlled by the microbiological ecologies. It is like the complexity of the human-gut interactions extended to all inside and outside surfaces. This makes discussions on TWIV about phages sticking their heads in mucus very fascinating to me. That was TWIM, I think. Mm, it was. This effectively put the phage between its bacterial host and the host's dinner on the animal's surface, a very good location for an ambush hunter phage that has almost no mobility. I could go on about how aquaculture can solve the food problem for the coming 3 billion people on this planet, better meat yield, better food conversion efficiency when the animals doesn't have to stand up or keep warm. The worldwide growth rate of aquaculture doubling in eight years will mean that the talents of the TWIV TWIM scientists will be required to understand how these microbiological ecologies really work and how to control the outcomes. We are seeing research dramatically increasing in every area relevant to trying to understand and control the microbiological ecologies of these complex systems, ranging from probiotics, prebiotics, to specific phages for bacterial problems, aquatic phage therapy, but the sources of this research are primarily outside the U.S. As aquaculture takes over the meat production business with its higher conversion efficiencies, the need for scientists who understand these complex systems will increase. Many of the TWIM followers will have a bright future opportunity outside of conventional academic research. Sorry to be long-winded. Love your programs. 
Uh, Dallas works at Scientific Hatcheries in Huntington Beach, California. There, he had a lot of meat, and no, no pun intended, <laughs> in in his uh, in his uh, narrative. And I was recently asked to to think about salmon anemia virus, mm-hmm. which is you know impacting on the um, farm raised fish industry. And uh, it it's really is is pretty devastating uh, to that group. And you wonder if something like a probiotic or a prebiotic, as he's saying, or even a phage, uh, could actually make that animal more resistant to that particular virus. So it's really a fascinating topic, and we're only beginning to understand how to do this. And but there are a lot of marine biologists out there. Uh, Microbiology is the big tent. You bet. We'll we'll welcome them. Uh, next one's from Robin, who writes, acellular pertussis vaccine. So we did that a couple of twims ago. That Thanks for the amazing stuff. Shows how much we have yet to learn. So Robin is a uh, physician who often writes us on our podcasts. Cough is an endobronchial symptom. Even whooping cough can be temporarily ameliorated by anesthetizing the epithelium by the inhalation of nebulized lidocaine. The technique used prior to bronchoscopy. My medical school microbiology is almost from the era of hunter gatherers with their sticks and stones, circa 1968. <laughs> oh my. If the volume of human knowledge is a sphere, the area of our ignorance, the known unknowns, Donald Rumsfeld, is the surface of the sphere. The volume increases by the cube of the radius while the area increases by its square. It leads to the correct perception that our area of ignorance is decreasing relative to the volume of our knowledge. However, what lies beyond the surface of the sphere, the unknown unknowns, is beyond our ken. Just as flatlanders cannot grok what's beyond the dimensions of their world, we cannot grok those unknown unknowns. And then he quotes from Michael Schmidt, expelling fomites. Fomites are, u- are objects, usually solid in the environment, which may usually passively harbor microorganisms. I think you said expelling fomites, Michael, at one point. Nah, I probably did. And one last one from Robert. He sends a link <laughs> to a YouTube video by, uh, this is just great, I don't know, a lot of people out there by the Muppets. It's called The Germ and Larger. (laughs) He says, Breakthrough in Microbiology, which I am surprised is not used today or discussed on TWIM. And we will let you watch this uh, wonderful Muppet video on The Germ and Larger. Thank you. Thank you for that, Robert. And that will do it for TWIM number 72. You can find us at iTunes and at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. And if you like what we do, you can go over to iTunes and rate the show, give us some stars or a few comments. That helps to keep us visible so more people can learn about this very cool world of microbiology, which gets cooler and cooler every day. Uh, You can send us your questions to twim at twiv.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan, where they use orange golf balls, I understand. (laughs) Or blue golf balls, right? We're thinking about orange basketballs. Thank you, Michelle. (laughs) <laughs> thank you Alio Schechter is at Small Things Considered thank you Alio my pleasure when? send us some water to San Diego oh my gosh I hear it. yes I hear well how about snow you can melt it <laughs> okay and actually we'll Michelle take anything Michelle has lots Liquid. of snow <laughs> should send, send him a little package Michelle <laughs> Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina thank you Michael thank you Vincent Thank you, everyone else. Cool papers today. And I am Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for supporting TWIM and Chris Kandian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.